Welcome, everybody, to a live edition of the Cover 2 Podcast, at least for Jared and I. We are about 15 minutes past the end of Game 1 of the NBA Finals, and due to our recording schedule, we decided to do a recap of Game 1, and we are going to try to do this after as many games as possible. Uh, So, Jared, let's just get into it. We just watched the uh, Phoenix Suns win Game 1 of the 2021 NBA Finals 118 to 105. DeAndre Ayton, Chris Paul, Devin Booker, all with 20 plus points. And uh, the Bucks uh, really weren't in it super close most of the second half. Uh, so, Jared, just your first initial thoughts. Let's get into the NBA Finals. Game one is over. The Suns are up 1 0. Your thoughts? Chris Paul, Chris Paul, Chris Paul, baby. Uh, I mean, he, he's so far the MVP. It's only been one game, but a lot of people, especially Suns fans, want to crown him right now. Has zero points, puts up a donut in the first quarter, and then from then on, uh, one of these score with 31. Uh, 12 from 19 from the field, 4 for 7 from 3. I mean, he was he was the, the orchestra leader, right? He was the, the captain out there, which he normally is. But, you know, for for – playing uh, 16 NBA seasons and this being his first NBA finals, obviously I think this meant a little more to him, you know, and, and this team just from the get go, man, they, they could not miss shots, right. They came out fired up and I think their youthfulness shows, right. I, I, we've talked about this before on this podcast. I think the Suns have a great mix of veteran guys like Chris Paul, like Dre Crowder. And then that youthful mix of uh, Cameron Payne, and obviously Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton. And so they gel so well. Even head coach Monty Williams during one of the timeouts when he was getting interviewed, he's like, I don't even want to get in Chris Paul's head. He's like, I'm not even really telling him much. So like Chris Paul is, is and kind of doing whatever he wants out there, whatever he, he feels best, right? So Monty Williams, as a coach, he's just sitting back and just chilling. He doesn't really have to say too much because Chris Paul is that good of a leader on the court. So... You know, to me, this game was about Phoenix. And let's give credit to the Bucks for coming back. They were down by, it was either 18 or 20 points at one point in the third quarter. Uh, and they kind of stayed in it, right? They could have very easily given up and said, hey, you know, we're, we're going to get ready for game two. But they fought back. So credit to them. But not only just about the Phoenix Suns, it was about Chris Paul making a statement that he's been waiting 16 years for this and he wasn't going to let this game slip away. Yeah, Chris Paul, the most impressive player in this game so far. Like you mentioned, 32 points. Uh, that is not his forte, getting that many points in a game. Nine assists, almost getting that double-double. Um, yeah, and, and perfect from the free throw line, 12-19 from the field, like you said. I want to take apart the Bucks a little bit because now I know that they're coming off, you know, not as many days off as the Bucks and – we can talk about that a little bit maybe at the end of this segment, why the Western Conference just for some reason got played the exact same amount of games but got more days off. Uh, I don't think that's fair to the Milwaukee Bucks. They should have realistically made this series every other day. And, it, you know, when the Suns-Clippers series ended, the Milwaukee Bucks were only in game four. And there was at least going to be three more games. So I do think the NBA screwed them over a little bit. But coming into this game, they had played very, very well without the Greek freak, Giannis and Tinikupo. Uh, they announced about 30 minutes before the game that Giannis was going to come back, or Giannis, excuse me. I've been pronouncing his name wrong for a very long time. I finally figured out you just pronounce it with a Y. It's super easy. Um, <laughs> but Giannis comes, you know, they announced before, it seems like, oh, we're going to get this great matchup. And, and the first half was pretty, pretty close, uh, or was pretty close. Um, although Gia- Giannis wasn't having a, a big impact on the game, Middleton was playing well. Lopez was pr- playing solid. Um, you know, Bobby Portis was contributing off the bench somewhat. Um, you know, and the Suns weren't missing shots, right? So the Bucks were down a little bit, but they had every chance that they could have in the second half to start that second half, you know, quickly come back, kind of like the Clippers and the Lakers did in their series against them. Um, but they didn't, and Giannis never got into the game. He, he missed five free throws in this game, seven out of 12, only one time to the free throw line did he make both free throws. That, 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 that's downright pathetic for a star player. I know that he had 20 points and 17 rebounds, but that's what he's supposed to do. He's a freak. 
He's seven foot tall and he can dunk from the free throw line. He's going to get a bunch of rebounds and he's going to score 20 points. You know, he seemed pretty healthy in this game too, but that doesn't mean you can miss free throws. And that was a big part in this game. Uh, when you look at the Bucks, they were from the free throw line nine for 16. The Suns were 25 to 26, right? That's 16 free throws made, uh, yeah. more made from the Suns, and they won the game by 13. So look at it right there, right? It, the, the Bucks, if they just make a, a few more free throws, they're right in this game, right? It's a big factor, especially near the end of that game. Giannis was still bricking free throws. Uh, but, you know, for the Bucs, I, I, I thought that not only did Giannis not play well, I don't like the way they play with him. And, Jerry, that's where I'm going to turn it to you. Uh, my analysis of this, uh, of this game is, is going to turn to this. What do you think about this whole dynamic of the fact that the Bucks won the last two games against the Hawks without Giannis? Now, I know Trey Young was, was hurt and didn't play in one of those games. But without Giannis, they played better. They won both Game 5 and Game 6 in the Eastern Conference Finals. And then tonight, they looked a little clunky with Giannis in the lineup. What are your thoughts on this weird dynamic of almost the Bucks playing better without Giannis? I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to talk about that after you were done. So, and and I think it was uh, Mark Jackson who brought it up in the third quarter when this actually happened. Uh, The Bucs were obviously down by double digits. They needed a spark. It looked like this game was getting out of hand. And they decided to go somewhat small ball. They put Giannis at the five, right? They took Brooke Lopez out. Um, I believe also Bobby Portis, crazy eyes. He was out as well. And it really kind of went small, right? They surrounded Giannis with shooters. So from a defensive standpoint, when Giannis has the ball at the top of the key, if he wants to drive and get past his defender, he has two legit options. Like you mentioned, he's seven foot and he can dunk from the free throw line. So if he wants to go at the rim, he can do that or he can kick it out. And I think that's when the Bucks started to make a run. I know at one point they had a seven, nothing run. They dropped it down to single digits. And it looked like it was about to be a real game. But like we've said already a couple times, the Suns just did not miss. They had an Mm -hmm. answer for every single Bucks run uh, that Milwaukee was able to put together. But I do think a huge adjustment going into game two is the Bucks are going to just have to play smaller, right? Like Brooke Lopez, he had a good game. He he made a couple threes. He he, he impacted the game offensively and defensively. Um, But between him and Bobby Portis, I think they're going to have to split minutes. I don't think both of those guys can play you know, 20 30 people is going to have to play more than not. And they're going to have to go small ball with Drew Holiday really leading the charge as a point guard. One of the reasons why the Bucks were so successful without Giannis and why they were able to win uh, was because Drew Holiday was so uh, effective and he was aggressive, right? And, and I don't think he was as aggressive in this game. Obviously, when Giannis is on the court, you want to get him involved, regardless of if he's 100% or not. So to me, put Giannis at the five, let Drew Hall they run the best plays. I think that gives the Bucs a better chance to be in the series. I, I think the Bucs are going to come out. They have a little bit more of a blueprint now of how to guard and defend this Phoenix Suns team from a defensive standpoint. Offensively, that would put Drew Holiday as the true point guard, let him handle the ball. Giannis at the five, play off ball, and basically just let him get lobs and dumps all night. Yeah, I mean, so what you're trying to say essentially is play like the Suns, right? Like, use your athletic freak as the freak that he is. DeAndre Aiden, what was he, 20 and 20 tonight? That guy was unbelievable rebounding the ball and also getting in involved offensively. I don't see DeAndre Aiden shooting. Now, clearly DeAndre Aiden and, 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 and Giannis are different. Aiden is more of a prototypical center that can shoot, um, but really doesn't that often. And then Giannis... You know, he can shoot threes. He's more of a, of a power forward, right? Um, the, the one problem I see with that, Jared, is that I think Middleton, who's played really, really well um, in this game, although he missed a lot of shots, he still, he still played well. He, he, he was making shots, like, out of nowhere and, and retaliating against the Suns, um, you know, very impressively in this game. Although he missed a bunch of shots, a lot of those shots, you know, we're, we're later in the game when they were down by a bunch and they're trying to get points. So I'll, I'll give them credit there. But um, I think that if you just have Holiday and then you have Giannis play off the ball and you have him play solo, then I think Middleton gets lost in the shuffle and he doesn't play well when he doesn't get the ball as much, I feel like. Like, he's he when, he, when they force him to be a spot-up shooter, 
I don't like the way he plays. And consistently, he's been in the playoffs inconsistent uh, when he's played like that. And so, you know, I just I, I think that Giannis just needs to be more aggressive. I thought in this game he wasn't as aggressive. Maybe it has to do with his knee. But if you are going to play, you have to do what you used to do. I don't want to hear that you're hurt. Everybody in these playoffs is hurt, Jared. Literally everybody. LeBron was hurt. Anthony Davis was hurt. Kawhi was hurt. Uh, for the Clippers, Zubak was playing hurt. Marcus Morris was playing hurt. CP3 has played hurt. Uh, the, Trey Young, he played hurt. Like, I don't want to hear that because you're hurt that you can't do the same things you do. Then don't play because the Bucs clearly could have played well without you. I, do I think they would have won this game? No, because the Suns played a fantastic basketball game. But – Giannis is going to be more aggressive with the ball. And Holiday's just got to make some shots, man. Four for 14, uh, zero three-pointers, 10 points. He didn't even get a double-double there. He got 10 points. Come on, man. You got to play better than that. Again, the Bucs were right there. As much as it, looks like the, as it looked like the Suns blew them out in this game, man, if they just make a couple threes here and there, Holiday plays a bit better, and Ted Kempo plays a little bit better, and they make key free throws, they're right in the game where a three – really shifts momentum. When you're in those close games, Jared, as we know with the Clippers Sun series specifically, there was a lot of times where just energy switched because the games always stayed close uh, besides the last one. And, and, and then one team shifted momentum just based on one shot down by five or six. So, you know, I, I, the Bucks are fine. They're, they're not out of this finals at all. And I know that's ridiculous to say in general, but they just need to come back. They need to play a bit, a little bit better defensively. And I think Giannis just be, needs to be more aggressive. And Holiday needs to make more shots. And they're right in this game. Um, now, Jared, I want I want to switch to the Suns. Uh, I thought there was key contributors besides Chris Paul, um, like Cam Johnson off the bench. He played well. Um, obviously, Devin Booker did hit did his stuff. Uh, you know, ten free throws made, although only made one three, so he could play a little bit better. And Aiden played amazing. Here's the thing. When you look at Crowder, Crowder scored one point. It was a free throw when they were up by like 12 at the end of the game. Okay. He was 0 for 5 from 3, 0 for 8 from the field, 9 rebounds, but 0 everything else. Uh, 0 assists, 0 steals. Um, do you maybe entertain uh, Cam Johnson as potentially getting more minutes? Uh, he got 21 compared to Crowder's 33, but – so you're shaking your head. Why do you think Crowder should stay in there when he has such a bad game? I know it's broke, don't fix it. But if you look at, like, the way the Clippers and Suns adjusted in the in the last series, <clears throat> I think the reason those games were always so competitive is because even if a team won, they adjusted the next game. So why do you think Cam Johnson shouldn't get more minutes than Bridges or Crowder, who he I thought he played better than tonight? Well, a couple reasons. One, it's one game. Right. Uh, we saw in the last series against the Clippers what Jay Crowder could do. And even in the series before that, Jay Crowder was knocking down threes along with guarding the other team's best player most of the game. Right. So he just had an off night and he's not known as like a three point specialist. Right. His main job to be in there is to play great defense, disrupt the other team's best player. And then when Chris Paul has it rolling and Devin Booker and they want to get double teamed, he's in the corner to attempt to make threes, right? So, yeah, he was off tonight. He only made one point, but guess what? That's why you have Cameron Payne. That's why, you know, you've got Cam Johnson and the other role players to step up to where the Suns have three or four role players that it just, if just two of those guys step up to go along with Chris Paul and Devin Booker, the Suns have a very good chance of winning every single night. They do not need every single player to play well because they have so much good depth around them. Uh, you know, in the playoffs, everyone says that the, the bench gets shorter, right? You're not playing every single player on your bench. So the Suns had five guys come off their bench, um, you know, giving them, what was it, a total of 22 points total, right? So it was Cam Johnson and Payne that, that scored in double that Right now, game two, it could be Crowder that scores in double figures, and Johnson and Payne don't. But I think as long as each game you have one of those depth guys stepping up, I think you're going to be okay. So to me, Crowder, you you kind of said it. You answered your own question. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's one game. Now, if he goes game two, game three, and he goes 0 for 5, 0 for 6 from 3, then maybe I start to give – start to entertain the idea of putting Cam Johnson in there 
in later games. Crowder's a veteran. He's one of the only players on the Suns that has been to a finals before. I, I'm letting this one slide because he was playing good defense and doing other things well, like you mentioned, and affecting games in other ways. So I'm, I'm cool with that. I'm not going to you know go crazy just because he had an off-night shooting. That's not what he's in there to do. If he's a bench player and he's a knockdown three-point shooter typically, and then he came in and missed over because, you know, those types of guys are, are but he's in there to play good defense, guard the other team's best player, and, and do that kind of dirty role type thing. So I'm cool with it. And they won. I, you, no, no, I, I get it. I, I get it. They won. It, but but you, if you look at the one weakness that the Suns had, it was clearly Jay Crowder. He, he's afraid. And I have to disagree with you. He did not make shots against the Clippers. Uh, he made shots in the Nuggets series in the Lakers game. Against the Clippers, he just missed wide open threes. I remember I remember hoping that he would shoot more in the games, and it worked every single time. I, I think that last game he stepped up a little bit and played better. Um, but again, you know, the Suns had all the momentum in that game six against the Clippers, so any, everybody was making shots. Um, I, I, I didn't say necessarily that you start Cam Johnson. I just think that if Crowder gets in a little bit of trouble, misses two threes to start that game, I think you might you might want to put a guy like Cam Johnson. In. I know he he's talked a lot with with Crowder as, as it's almost like a veteran rookie kind of thing. Although Johnson's not a rookie, but he's still a very very young player. Um, I don't think Crowder would have a problem with a switch up a little bit in his role to maybe make him play better, right? Yeah, maybe Johnson gets a little bit more tired during the game, doesn't play as well offensively, but still plays well defensively. I think you got to get Crowder a little bit involved because when the Bucks start making shots, you got to have Crowder, you know, from the corner making threes, and you have to have Bridges, who's done nothing like most of these playoffs, um, make those threes. And those two guys don't make their shots. What I saw tonight was Cam Johnson making those shots. So just a thought. I think uh, I think Johnson needs to be playing around thirty minutes next game, uh, especially if Crowder and Bridges do not start making shots early in that game. I think you need to put Johnson there. Bench gets shorter, like you said, Jerry. Like you said, use him as a six man, a true six man. I'll give you this. I'll give you this. I think Crowder has earned the right to be the starter because of his leadership in the front of the postseason. I'll give you credit. You watched more of the Clipper games, uh, Clipper Suns, than I did. So if Crowder wasn't making shots there, okay. But you know what? Like I said, he's still in there for his defensive presence. I think later in games, right, if games are close, obviously this game was not as close. Uh, 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 it's not going to be like in every single game. I guarantee the Bucks will come out and make adjustments, and it will be a closer game in game two. I can see Monty Williams wanting to make that offensive-defensive substitution to where if it's a defensive possession and Jay Crowder offensive possession, then you're potentially putting Cam Johnson in for his three-point shooting and just his better offensive capability. I can see that in a later game situation, but I'm sorry, it's just way too early for me to take James Crowder out just because he had a bad game or maybe he had a bad series against the Clippers. That dude is, like I said, he's a veteran and he's earned his time uh, to shine here. Even if it's not scoring points, he's doing the other dirty work doing until he show up in that stat sheet. So he had a big uh, kind of a, a, a steal that went off of, I think it was Middleton's leg in the fourth quarter. He does those things sometimes that just don't so, show up on the stat sheet. So I'm cool. Like I said, I, it's not that I'm cool with him going over eight. You want to see him make a couple, but I, I, as long as he's doing the other things, I'm okay. Yeah, no, you caught a little bit there, but but I think the gist of what, what Jared was saying there was that he 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 likes Crowder's energy, which I like too. I I, I love Crowder's energy, and, and, and I think that is a big part do I think that I could come off the bench? Yes. Uh, but, okay, so, hey, Jerry, hey, let, me, let me... You know what? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I was going to say, speaking of energy, uh, can we talk about this Suns fans energy real quick when Giannis is at the free throw line? We, we, we didn't get into this, but can we talk about this well, just let's get it, Let's get into it. Let's get into it because, oh, I, I mean, it's a great thing that they're doing because – He's committing a violation every single time. What are the referees doing? If that number from the fans hits 12, it's for sure a violation. If it's 11, I get it. Whatever. That happens all the time with five-second violations out of bounds. And, you know, it's that 5.9, right? That 10.9. But when it's in 12 or 13, what are the refs doing? Like, call Wait, the is it? I thought it, was, I thought it was 15. I thought it was 15. I don't know. I, if it's 15, then I'm completely wrong, and he's not even, it's not even close. But 
the fans, have, nonetheless, it started with the Brooklyn Nets. And the Suns, this was the best one, though. I agree. And, and the energy from the Suns crowd in general was great, like it's been the whole playoffs as well. But, I mean, it clearly affects him, right? Like, he, he's well, in his head. Step up and make the damn shot, bro. Stop with your dribbles and your you, – like, stop it. Just put the free – like, you see, ever see Lou Williams shoot three or, or shoot free throws or Steph shoot free throws? He's get up there and shoot it. I get he's big and all that stuff and he has trouble shooting, but he puts it way too much in his head. It reminds me on a very minor scale of Markel Fultz and Ben Simmons where they just put it too much in their head. Um, but, yeah, the energy from the crowd was great, um, and it will keep going. And game two will be tough, and I guarantee you he'll make it. He'll miss a couple free throws here and there. Hopefully, it's not near the end of the game, so we we don't label him as you know the next playoff P, right? But you know, I I think that once he gets home, it will be fine. He'll start making his free throws. But yeah, the, the energy in the crowd. It, it's Phoenix. Keep on doing it. It's affecting the guy. Well, it, it, the game. It's great. It, so listen, the, the crowd is great, right? And obviously, it was great in Atlanta. I think Atlanta had way better of an energy than what Brooklyn did. And I think the Suns fans are picking up off of what Atlanta did, right? So here's the thing. It can go two ways. It's a double-edged sword. On one hand, like you said, Giannis is in his own head, right? The fans are kind of counting him down. And he's like, oh, man, if I miss these, they're just going to gonna get on me even more and more, right? But on the flip side, I think he could use that to his advantage, right? He now should never, ever get a violation again as long as fans are counting him down. Because he can literally sit there, and when the fans are 11, he knows he's got to shoot it, right? Before the fans started chanting, he didn't necessarily – I don't he had his own clock in his own head, right? The referees obviously were counting, and when it got to I – I think it's 15. Maybe it is 12. I could be wrong as well. But whatever number it is, whenever it got there, then the referees were just blowing the whistle. So Giannis was probably never actually thinking about the clock in his own head. But now that the fans are helping him, I think he should use that to his advantage. So just speed up your, your process by like half a second or a second, right? And then, like I said, when the fans get to 10 or 11, they're helping you out, dude. Boom. Shoot it at 12. Like, I, to me, if I'm honest, I'm trying to use that as an advantage as opposed to a disadvantage. Here's the thing, though. It's not realistic. It's not reality right now. When you look back at the last three games that Giannis has played on the road, he's he's gone six for thirteen from free from the free throw line, zero oh for three before his inter, uh, his injury in game four, and then tonight seven for twelve. So even before he was hurt, he still missed all his free throws. And, and, and in game three in Atlanta, he missed seven free throws. And tonight he missed five three foot free throws. So yeah, you know what I get, Jerry. Here's the thing. As you know, I've worked at a concert venue in the past. There's some concerts that are very, very loud. And I, I, I've had to wear earplugs even as uh, my profession. I need to hear people uh, what I'm doing. But um, is there any chance that Giannis maybe on the road in game two? Could every single time he goes to the free throw line have like the, the equipment guy give him two earplugs and just, and just take him? Is that allowed in the NBA? Can you do that? Can you put earplugs in your ears at the free throw line? And then he can just toss them and get rid of them right after the second free throw when he makes both, because I'm sure he'll start making free throws. Are you allowed to do that? I don't know. Remember, we're spinballing. This is 15 minutes after the game. I'm not doing any research on this. But could he put earplugs in his ears after every single time he goes to the free throw line? You have a break. It's possible. I'm going I'm to I'm 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 say no. I'm going to say no. Um, <laughs> it's not the worst idea. You can, wear a headband. Uh, you can wear a headband, but you can't wear earplugs. That makes no sense. Come on. Get the sweat yeah, out of your listen, eyes. Just wear, just wear a headband and then just pull it down to your ears when you're shooting free throws. And then when you're done, just boom, pull right back up. <laughs> no, but okay, but in all reality, Jared, it, it's just not realistic. He can't make free throws. Could he use it to his advantage? Yes. But I, I just think it affects the guy. I think he's one of those playoff guys that gets affected by this. And he, he, was, he took it too far with the time. And now the fans are messing with him. And, and all he can do, realistically, in my opinion, is um, is just start making free throws. Until he makes, like, 10 out of 12 in a game on the road, like in game two, I don't think it's going to improve. Uh, I think he's, it's, he's in his head, and he just has to bury these free throws and figure out a way. Yeah, whether it's using your, your, your tactic of just using the fans to your advantage and mocking them after you make them, right? 
that will shut up the crowd real quick. If you go four for four and then you start, you start wait, you know, you start telling them to get out. Like maybe you should do that. Right. I don't know. But, but, but the reality is the last three games and the three biggest, uh, you know, playoff games on the road of his career, realistically, um, he is, he's gone awful from the free throw line and, and missed more free throws than he's made. You know, so. I'm surprised that teams haven't done the hacky on it. I mean, I was but, thinking about that today. I was thinking about the on the road, not at home. You can't do it at home. He'll just make the free throws. But when you're on the road, yeah, in those big time moments, and I think they do, Jared. I you see, you like a lot of times he'll just lose the ball. I remember when we were watching live on this podcast to one of the Nets Bucks games. He he just loses the ball because they think they hack at him. They know that he's not going to get as many calls because he's a freak and he's seven foot tall, much like Kevin Durant, much like LeBron. Uh, you know, much like a lot of other players, they just don't get calls when they're bigger. Um, but he also panics and he, and they know he can't make free throws and he can't make free throws like a star. Even if he makes free throws, he's not going to go 12 for 12 in the game. But if he misses one or two, that's OK, because he's seven foot tall. When you're seven foot tall, you can you can miss free throws. OK, I'm just telling you that right now. You can miss one or two here and there unless you're Kevin Durant. But um, I just think that. You know, I think teams already employ that. And if if, if I'm um, if I'm Monty Williams, I go to PJ Tucker and Jay Crowder and Mikhail and Mikhail Bridges and Cam Johnson. I go just hack the crap out of him, right? If you could actually get the ball, get the ball. But if you can, he's going up for a shot. Do not let him get M ones. Do not let him put up easy layup. If he's gonna dunk, let him dunk. But anything besides a dunk or a three, do you, you foul him? Foul him, right? He'll just get discombobulated. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that hasn't happened already. And, and I, I don't know if it's because, like, he's such a superstar. But then again, it's like Shaq was a superstar and everyone hacked the heck out of him. So, yeah, I think if it's a close game, right, and you're right, it's it's got to be on the road at home. The fans yeah. are obviously going to be for Giannis. So, uh, game two, and then if there is a game five or a potential game seven, if I'm Monty Williams and it's close, yeah. I got to think about, hacking Giannis because Giannis is going to be on the court, right? As long as he's not fouled out, he is the best player on the court for the Bucks. He's going to be on the court. So you don't have to worry about, you know, like this isn't the, the Philadelphia 76ers and, and Doc Rivers, you know, pulling Ben Simmons, even though Ben yeah. Simmons is a good player, he just can't shoot at all, right? And this is not about that. Giannis, Giannis is going to be on the floor. You're going to have opportunities to hack him. Hey, it's another opportunity for your boy Cam Johnson to get in the game to potentially get Damn some, right. some fouls. There you go. Damn right. We're trying to get your ball there the you court. Go. There you go. Um, Jerry, I'll, I'll say this right now. Giannis is going to miss a few free throws in the beginning game, and we will see it. We will see it later. We will see it later when it's close. He will get hacked on purpose. Whether it kind of looks unintentional, he will get hacked on purpose later in that game if he misses free throws early in the game. If he starts making them, they won't do it because they know his confidence will get a little bit better. And I think his confidence will get a little better if he just makes his first two free throws. He goes one for two, it's over. It's over, and he's gonna go for six, he's gonna go six for 14. Watch. I'm telling you. He'll go 50% from the free throw line if he if he goes 50% from his first two. I'll have to put that on, on Twitter. I'll put that on Twitter. Giannis will will but if he makes the first two, he'll have a good game and the Bucs will win. <laughs> I'll, I'll just throw it out there. Wow. Okay. It's that, it's that simple. It's that simple. Speaking of that, we're 30 minutes into the podcast. Let's get some predictions from game two and specifically, Jared, how the Bucks can win. Because the Suns, I think if they just do the same thing, they're going to have a very, very good chance of winning as long as Crowley doesn't go for zero points again. But, you know, if, if Paul and Aiton and Booker are all 25 plus points, 20 plus points, right? And they're getting double doubles left and right. I think it's over, and, and the Suns will win at home. But what are your reasons for how the Bucks are going to win game two, and what is your actual prediction for game two? Well, I kind of i have already said the, the Bucks is that they have to go smaller, right? They kind of have to play yeah. into the Phoenix Suns' hands a little bit. Not to say that Brooke Lopez uh, and um, – uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking here right now. Um, and Portis, Portis, Portis. you know, yeah. don't play at all, right? I, I think their minutes just need to be restricted a little bit. And I think Giannis needs to play more at the five. I need, I think there need to be more shooters around Giannis. Chris Middleton has to come to play. Uh, and you got to give the ball to Drew Holiday and really let him be the true point guard. Because there are times where Giannis is dribbling ball, the ball up court. We saw that in the first quarter of this game. I think when Giannis looked his best, 
right? I think that's he, he was he was probably the most fresh there. Um, and he actually we, we saw him go down the court and, and get some and ones and that type of thing. So uh, I think Drew Holiday needs to be the true point guard. Giannis needs to play more off the ball and basically drive and attack or drive and ditch. Because when they were doing that for spurts in the third quarter and into the fourth quarter, this game was within single digits and within reach, right? When they were playing more big ball and they had Brooke Lopez and Bobby Portis or one of those two guys in with Giannis when Giannis was playing at the four, even though Brooke Lopez can stretch out and shoot the three, I think they're more of a liability on defense. They can't necessarily switch. We saw it from the Suns. That's literally all they want to do is switch and get a mismatch, whether it's Chris yeah. Paul or Devin Booker. They're trying to get a mismatch with Brooke Lopez. Chris Paul was eating him up all night. Obviously, we saw him with 31 points from the second half on. Devin Booker was doing his thing with 27. They live in that mid-range, trying to get a small on a big and get that mismatch. So if I'm, the, I'm going small to get better mismatches on defense and from an offensive standpoint, get more shooting out there, be able to keep up with the three-point shooting that the Suns have. Now, I still think the Suns win this game, but I think game two is a lot closer. I don't think that this game ever gets out of reach from the Bucs. I, I think this game stays within single digits the entire game, and it's a lot closer. I'm still giving this to the Suns. Right now, they're just too hot, right? Even though they have more rest than the Bucs did, I just can't go against the Suns right now because I think they are just gelling and playing too well. Jared, um, you know, I had to disagree with you a little bit on the small lineup. Uh, I've said that I want Giannis to be more aggressive, but I think you you have to keep Brooke Lopez in there to try to defend DeAndre Ayton. Um, you can have Giannis defend Ayton, and do I think he's more athletic than Ayton? Yes. But I don't think Giannis is used to guarding a center like that. Really, nobody is. Zubak did a pretty good job some games before he got hurt, but – you know, nonetheless, you can't really stop Aiden every single game. He's going to do what he did today uh, in some games. I just think the Bucks realistically need to play better defense. Uh, they need to be more aggressive. Giannis needs to be more aggressive, but this is more about defense for me. Drew Holiday is considered one of the best uh, guard defenders in the league. And the two guards went off for almost 60 points. So you can't have that happen, okay? Holiday needs to play, play better on defense. Maybe that affected him offensively this game. I don't know. That's one thing. But I think specifically you target Devin Booker because Chris Paul is playing great right now. He's healthy. He's played great the last two games. He has the momentum on his side. So let Chris Paul cook a little bit. Let him do it. He's the old guy. He'll tire himself out. I guarantee it. He's had tough playoffs. He had COVID. Okay? Something will happen to him in, in, in this next game to where he won't be able to do the same thing that he has the last two games, when you put all the focus on him. If you can keep Devin Booker under 20 points or at, like, 20 points um, and not let him get to the free throw line, that's no better chance. Uh, and I also just think – I think if you just, if you just focus a, 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 and make Jake Crowder shoot, Mikael Bridges shoot, Cam Johnson shoot, you know, even Cameron Payne, I think that's where you can win this game. Because Middleton and Giannis – and even Brooke Lopez will make more shots than Jay Crowder, Mikhail Bridges, and Cam Johnson, realistically, unless one of those guys decides to go off, then the series is over, Jared, okay? But lot, I think— a lot easier said than done. Needs to play more aggressively. If your knee's okay, your knee's okay. Um, Holiday needs to play better defense, specifically on Chris Paul, and you put a person on Devin Booker that can try to stop them, a la Patrick Beverly, okay? Uh, and, and, and you try to contain Aiden out, rebound him, demoralize him. Um, I think that's the way. Uh, and I think this, I think the Bucks will win. Yeah, I think it will be extremely close. Um, I think Chris Middleton will make a big shot at the end. Maybe Giannis will come will come through and make a big shot at the end. Maybe Pat Connaughton will make a big shot at the end. But I think the Bucks will win an extremely close one, uh, and it will be one one. Does that mean? Did the Bucs have more of a chance in this series? No. Looking at this, I think the Suns should win the NBA Finals this year, which is crazy to think before this season. But if the Bucs can win game two, you go, you try to grab even more momentum in game three, I think they'll do it. But Giannis has got to play more aggressive, make his free throws, and the defensive strategy has to be more focused on stopping Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton than it is stopping Chris Paul. Because Chris Paul will switch, and he will cook. 
Brooke Lopez, and he will cook Giannis, okay? But if you can stop the other guys, one guy cannot win you a game. So there you go. I got great great offense Brooke. beats great defense nine out of ten times. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe. We'll see. Great DA. Yeah, hey, look at, look, at the, look at the great defenses in the NBA. You, you, you know, they, they've always had. In, okay, okay. Individual defense, right? Well, well, I'm not talking about team defense here. I'm talking about yes. individual defense. You're talking about you're talking about Drew Holiday and or BJ Tucker locking down Devin Booker and or Chris Paul. I don't think they can do that one on one, right? I think that's going to be a collective PJ effort. Tucker, PJ Tucker to... shouldn't even be playing. PJ Tucker shouldn't even be playing, bro. That guy has an impact on the last two series, and it's only because of his toughness that they keep him out here. But that guy really doesn't do that much and can't guard guards. He's just a short forward. It's slow, okay? Uh, I don't know who you have try to stop, uh, you know, um, try to stop Booker, but you just got to have a guy focus on him. That's what I think. I think when, when you had Beverly do it, although Beverly's insane and was shoving people at the end of that series, I think that you, you ha- he did stop Devin Booker a couple times and a shot here and there, and the Clippers win that series. So, you know, and that strategy worked. They just lost the games at the end. So, yeah, that, that's – I'll go with the way the Clippers won and stayed in games. You, you, you got to stop Booker and you got to try to contain Aiden. That's how they played better. And that's how those games were always close. When they didn't do that, every team got smoked in the playoffs. The Bucks tonight, the Nuggets, the Lakers, and the Clippers a few games. So there you go. All right, Jared, I couldn't end this podcast uh, without talking about my Clippers. Okay. I, I got to give my opinion and, and just let you guys know what I thought about the teams. I know I said I was going to talk about it, but. Jared and I had a little bit of difficulty uh, scheduling a podcast right after the Clippers series. Uh, but I just want to say, you guys, okay, that I'm very, very excited about this team. I'm excited about Reggie Jackson. <laughs> excited about Paul. De- stop it, Jared, stop it. Uh, I'm sorry. My bad, my bad, my bad. Go ahead. Go your your ahead. Lakers were eliminated in the first round. I don't like all these Lakers fans talking all this crap, and, and their team had the same problem and lost in the first round, the same team, in the same amount of games. Okay? I don't want to hear it. Uh, I'm excited about playoff P in the playoffs next year because he finally stepped up. Okay? And I think this team, the, the, the key to this team is Ty Lue. Okay? I said it last year during the pandemic that I thought the problem might be Doc Rivers because – there's just something about him. You look at with the 76ers, right? It just didn't, doesn't work, right? He doesn't know how to win those big games. And it took a super, super team to win one NBA Finals against the Lakers, okay? And, and, and so, you know, I, I think that Ty Lu is such a great coach. You, you format that roster to let Reggie Jackson do his thing, to let Paul George do his thing, and let Kawhi, if he does come back, do his thing. Um, but even if Kawhi biggest. doesn't, even if Kawhi doesn't come back, if Jerry, we will get into that probably at the end of the season, or if we hear some rumors on our next podcast. Even if Kawhi leaves, I think if you just add another supplemental player to Marcus Morris, to Paul George, to Reggie Jackson, if they can re-sign Reggie Jackson, I think this Clippers team is right up there with some of the best teams in the NBA. And, and I think that the way they played without Kawhi Leonard shows that even without him, they could potentially make an NBA Finals. I mean, Jared, like I mentioned, you know, if DeAndre Aiden, if they call the foul at the end of that game in game in game two, the Clippers win. It's one one. They they're, they're going into that that you know they're going into game five tied up two uh, two and not down three one. Momentum changes. Um, if, if the refs make a couple calls in, in one of the games at the end and decide to actually, you know, not try to send the Suns to the NBA Finals, uh, the Clippers win. Or have a chance down by one to win that that real uh, uh, short scoring game where it was like eighty one to seventy eight. Mind mind to be a Celtics Lakers game set uh, back in the day. Um, so you know, like I'm saying, Jared, you got to be realistic. The Clippers were a few shots and a few plays away from being in the NBA Finals without Kawhi Leonard. So I'm excited about this team. I like Ty Lue, and. You know, I think the Clippers gained a lot of respect from a lot of fans. I don't hear the chirping as much as I thought because of the way the Clippers played from a lot of fans that normally would have chirped. Jared, you were honest and you still chirped. And I can respect that. And, and that, maybe that's why I've been chirping your Cowboys a little bit the last couple of days. But uh, 
nonetheless, a lot, I think that makes sense. Up a lot of people shut up a lot of haters. Paul George did too. I know he missed a couple big shots here and there and didn't play well in some games, but it happens, right? You know, Giannis doesn't play well in some games. Chris Middleton doesn't play better in some games, but I think they still got a chance. So I'm excited about my Clippers. And I, here's, here's me saying it. Even without Kawhi, if they can add another top tier player, not even a star, I think with Paul George, Marcus Morris, Reggie Jackson, I think that team is uh that team's a NBA Finals team. Can they win against the Nets? Probably not, but we'll just see. Because I think the Nets are the favorite next year. I think everybody escaped them this year with uh, Kyrie and Harden getting hurt. But yeah, so my thoughts on the Clippers is all positive. And like I said, a couple shots here and there, a couple fouls called by those referees. Uh, the Clippers are in the NBA Finals, Jared, and they're playing the Bucks, and I think they win Game One just like they just like the Suns did. So, yeah, that's my yeah, thought. Hey, hey, let's let's give them the banner. Let's give them a banner for the first time in their 60-year history, making it out of the second round. Let's give them Finals. a banner for almost winning the Western Conference Finals. Let's, uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, proud of them, man. Listen, they, they they made some big steps, some big progress this year. I mean, listen, I will give them a little bit of credit. I, they did play better than I thought without Kawhi. Without Kawhi, I was like, this team's about to get swept. There's no way they're going to win a game. They did come together together uh, and play a lot better without him. I think Ty Lue, like you mentioned, is a, a big glue piece. And I think he just relates a little more to these players than Doc Rivers does. So uh, I can't believe I'm actually you know, saying anything nice about the Clippers. But yes, they did surprise me and play better without Kawhi. I think there's a real legitimate possibility that Kawhi is not in a Clippers uniform. Form next year. Now, for a full 82 game season and the playoffs, I'm not so sure that's the best thing for them. But, you know, the, the early rumors are that it's not a guarantee that Kawhi is coming back. So we will let that play out and we will see what happens going forward. But the Clippers did play better than I expected. So that's about all I will say to them. Uh, they still have not done anything of relevance, uh, even with Kawhi and Paul George going back to last year and this year. They made it to the Western Conference Finals and they lost. Yeah. It's a it's a great story that happens. happens. I, I'm just saying, like, you, you look at the Clippers, man, they always play better without stars, right? Like, remember that series against the Warriors, that, that like, best Warriors team of all time? And they won two games with Lou Williams and Montrezl Harrell, who didn't play mm -hmm. a, at all for their respective teams most of the regular season and and and, and uh, in the playoffs, besides Lou the last couple games with Trey Young getting hurt. But, I mean, yeah. I, I like the Clippers a lot more without the Stars. I wouldn't mind Kawhi leaving. If he does stay, though, we're winning the finals. It, 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 it's, it's that simple. It's, it, it's, it's finally okay. in his third year. Right. Yeah. We're, 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 <laughs> we're, 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 we're going to end this podcast right now. I, I've said we've already talked about the Clippers way more than we should have. They are done. They are not in the finals. Today's about podcast it was about the two finals contestants. Uh, and, and we're now talking, getting into hypotheticals about next year, about the Clippers winning the championship, which will probably never happen in our lifetime. So let's stick to the reality here. Our lifetime. We're young, Jared. That, that, is, that is just not nice. I All know. Right. It's a scary thought for you. I know. Hey, I will say this, though. They're at least one more year in Los Angeles because I think they were going to go to Seattle if they lost in the second round. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to get moved to uh, Seattle. God, I wish they would have left. Please, go, please go to Seattle. I go to still, San Diego. I get get still, out of I, LA, man. Wherever they go, wherever they go, I'm still going to cheer for that team. I'm still, I, I, res I respect the hell. Um, but yeah, so many discussions about Ty Lu and LeBron and Kawhi Leonard on another podcast. But we're going to end this one today. Uh, just wanted to recap and do a little basketball. Um, our next podcast, we don't know when we're going to record it, Jerry. We might be able to record Friday after game two. We will see. Um, but nonetheless, next podcast, we will be, uh, we'll be talking about the MLB All-Star game, either recapping what happened All-Star weekend, depending on the day we record, or talking about Tani being a hitter and pitcher in the All-Star game. Um, we're going to be talking about Trevor Bauer. Lots of thoughts on that on uh, the next podcast, no matter what. Uh, interesting there. Um, and just all-star game in general. Um, and, uh, and, and whatever NBA finals games have happened, we will talk about them. So we will have a podcast coming to you soon. But the Game 1 NBA Finals recap is finished. Uh, I am Nick Nina. I'm Jared Smith. And we'll see you next time, guys. Suns up, 1-0. Peace.